Section 5 Liquidity Risk and Tail Risk in Credit Portfolios As we've discussed before, liquidity is the ability to purchase or sell an asset quickly and easily at a price close to fair market value. The risk of not being able to do this is liquidity risk. So when liquidity is low, liquidity risk is high. In this lecture, I might use low liquidity and high liquidity risk interchangeably. In this segment, we look at measures of secondary market liquidity. We look at structural industry changes and the impact of these changes on liquidity risk. And we'll briefly discuss the management of liquidity risk. Then we'll move on to tail risk. We'll discuss how to assess tail risk in credit portfolios and how to manage tail risk. The first major point related to liquidity risk is that the liquidity of corporate bonds tends to be lower than the liquidity of sovereign bonds. And that implies that with corporate bonds, the liquidity risk is relatively high. So we need some measures for secondary market liquidity. And the three major measures are shown here. The first one is trading volume. The higher the trading volume, the higher the liquidity. In several large markets, we've observed that the trading volume has trended downwards, which implies that the liquidity of credit markets has gone down over the last few years. The next measure is spread sensitivity to fund outflows. The basic point is that if money is pulled out of the bond market, what is happening to the spread? The risk is that as money gets pulled out, the spread widens. So one specific measure would be spread widening measured in basis points divided by the percentage outflow. The percentage outflow is often defined as the total dollar value withdrawn from a particular fund divided by the fund's asset under management. The curriculum points out that for a given percentage outflow, the spread widening tends to be much higher with high yield bonds relative to investment grade bonds. So this higher widening for a particular percentage outflow implies that high yield bonds are less liquid than investment grade bonds. The classic measure of liquidity risk is the bid ask spread. The higher the spread, the lower the liquidity. During periods of high volatility, the bid ask spread can also be quite volatile. But once the volatility calms down, then the bid ask spreads also settle. But the central point here is that if liquidity is low, then the bid ask spread will be high. Structural industry changes and liquidity risk. There are two broad points here. One has to do with increased dealer reluctance to maintain large bond inventories and the other has to do with increased distribution of investment grade and high yield bonds. Let's take the first point. After the 2008-2009 financial crisis, new regulations were introduced because of which the ability of dealers to maintain large bond inventories went down. In the United States, where we have the largest bond market, the Volcker rule was introduced which restricted the dealer's ability to take risk, hold inventories and engage in some trading activities that would have helped support the bond market. With respect to willingness, even this went down after the crisis because the bond dealers became more risk averse. So the overall impact because of this structural change was a decrease in liquidity. The second point is increased distribution of investment grade and high yield bonds. In the past, a very large percentage of investment grade and high yield bonds was concentrated in a few funds. But now, investment grade and high yield bonds are distributed across a much larger set of funds. So this implies a higher liquidity. Now the two points here, the first one implied lower liquidity, the second one implies higher liquidity. Both these structural changes have occurred, but the first point dominates. So overall, the liquidity has gone down. Management of liquidity risk. There are several tools that are used to manage liquidity risk. 
One is simply the percentage of cash in the portfolio. Given the increased liquidity concerns, several fund managers have increased the percentage of cash in their portfolio. The next point has to do with managing position sizes. So fund managers can hold larger positions in bonds that are more liquid and related to that is holding liquid non-benchmark bonds. So a fund manager might deviate from the benchmark so as to hold bonds that are more liquid. This will make his portfolio more liquid. Another method is to use CDX index derivatives. Now this is an alternative way to get exposure to credit risk and the curriculum points out that the liquidity of CDS index derivatives is far higher than the liquidity of corporate bonds. So this method can be used to gain exposure to credit markets while maintaining liquidity. Fund managers can also use exchange traded funds. These have become very popular over the last few years. In fact, in 2016, the total value of high yield ETFs was $40 billion and for investment grade ETFs, it was $90 billion. A major advantage here is that an investor automatically gets diversity. A disadvantage is that money can flow in and out of ETFs very easily. So it is possible that the price of an ETF deviates from the net asset value. Tail risk. Tail risk is the risk that there are more actual events in the tail of a probability distribution than probability models would predict. The issue is that most probability models are based on a normal distribution. A normal distribution suggests that there will be a certain percentage of outcomes in the left tail. But in reality, we often have many more outcomes over here and the severity of the outcomes can also be much worse than what a normal distribution might predict. For this reason, tail risk events are difficult to model and almost impossible to predict in advance. So we need some tools to assess tail risk. The most commonly used tool is scenario analysis. We can have historical scenario analysis and hypothetical scenario analysis. With historical scenario analysis, we look at events from the past which are unusual but did happen and evaluate what would happen to a portfolio if events like those happened again. So for example, we might model the 2008-2009 crisis or we might create a scenario which replicates what happened with high yield bonds in the 2000 to 2002 time frame. Now, when coming up with these scenarios, we create events which are plausible but unusual. These are events that have a significant negative impact on bond prices and we want to see how the overall portfolio will be impacted when such events occur. So historical scenario analysis is based on what actually happened. But we can also create hypothetical scenarios. So these are scenarios that might happen but have not actually occurred in the past. When performing scenario analysis, we need to pay close attention to correlation. What has been observed is that during times of a financial crisis, the correlation between different types of bonds, between different sectors goes up and it becomes close to one. So for example, in the 2008-2009 crisis, bonds from sectors that seemed unrelated all started defaulting. So that implied a relatively high correlation and this needs to be considered when we are doing scenario analysis. Managing tail risk in credit portfolios, the most basic technique is portfolio diversification. So if we have a portfolio with high exposure to the oil industry, now this industry and bonds issued by companies in this industry will perform poorly if oil prices come down. So we should diversify and include bonds from, let's say, the airline sector, which will tend to do well when oil prices come down. This sort of diversification is relatively cost effective, but the disadvantage is that it's often difficult to identify attractively valued investment opportunities that can protect against every tail risk. Tail risk hedging involves using instruments such as credit default swaps and options 
So essentially these behave like an insurance policy and can protect against extreme events but the cost of these strategies tends to be high.